stream is up. Stream is up. And we are <laughs> we are live. <laughs> we are live <laughs> finally, guys. Okay, we've got this going. I am Jack Murphy. This is Jack Murphy Live Podcast. Pardon the technical issues we've been having today. It's been an adventure, but goodness gracious i am so excited to have julie kelly here on the show with me today julie how are you doing <laughs> i'm good i'm just here for to add all the technical difficulties today so sorry about that yeah i don't think that the technical difficulties were your fault it's definitely something going on in the air maybe it's because of the sensitive things that we have to talk about today it's entirely possible just kidding wink wink but here we are <laughs> we're here to talk about January 6th. We're here to talk about what happened at the Capitol, what the reports have been, what has happened after the fact, and what they're going to do with January 6th moving forward. Now, Julie, I was there. I was in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. Okay. I was downtown. I was at, I was at the, uh, the Trump speech, and I could tell that there was some weird stuff going on in the air that day. There was a lot of different energy mm -hmm. that I was unaccustomed to. And I had been downtown mm -hmm. all summer long through all the riots, all the protests, everything. And this was a very different circumstance. And, and, and I realized I didn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. So I left. I left. And then I watched it just with everybody else. And uh, nobody really seems to know what happened, Julie. And that's why we're here. We're here to talk about what happened. So first off, let's just talk about how did you get into this position where you're writing and investigating and researching all this stuff, Julie? Tell us a little bit about yourself in that, way, in that regard. Well, my background is really in politics. I worked as a political uh, consultant, communication consultant for years before I, I'm in suburban Chicago for mostly Republicans when there were still some Republicans left in Illinois. Um, and then I took several years off to be a stay-at-home mom, which is the greatest job ever. And uh, when my kids started going to school full time and trying to ignore me, I decided I needed something else to do. Uh, I really didn't want to get back into political consulting per se. I did that for a little while and then just started writing, really uh, started off writing about scientific issues, believe it or not, uh, the food industry and things like GMO, the organic industry that kind of led into climate change. And so it, it was just this kind of trajectory to where I am now writing full time about politics um, for American greatness. And somehow I uh, became one of the very few people willing to take on what was happening uh, January 6th and more importantly, what's been happening since. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. When you said that you, you wrote about uh, GMOs and, and climate change and, and what, and what, in what regard? Interesting pathway here. Um, well, it, it is. Uh, it really just started off about food because I also was a cooking teacher. I started teaching cooking classes out of my home. And so that kind of got me really interested in all the food issues that were happening at the time. This was under the Obama administration. So things like GMO labeling, uh, the national lunch program that M Michelle Obama uh, kind of orchestrated, took over, overhauled that program uh, to uh, the detriment of school children <laughs> across the country. Um, but anyway, just learning about GMOs. Uh, and agricultural uh, biotechnology, which I, in my opinion, has been really beneficial to the country, to our food system, to the environment. I know there are a lot of conservatives who disagree with that, but that's my, that was my take on it. I did a ton of research into that. Uh, the scam of organic food, um, looking at that industry and uh, a lot of the chicanery behind uh, the organic food uh, lobby and organic food industry, really. And then that just led to climate change and, uh, you know, exposing a lot of the same elements that we do see now. There was quite the, it was pretty symbiotic, the same people who were behind climate change crusade, also uh, behind COVID and lockdowns, et cetera. So that's why I was also a very early skeptic about lockdowns and our mitigation measures related to containing COVID because I saw a lot of the same players involved in that. So I do remember, I do remember that that's study, that the, the big study, the uh, Neil Stevenson, I think was his name. I can't remember the guy's name, but uh, the same Institute in England that does all this climate study, climate right. science uh, study. So it's Neil not Ferguson. surprising to me that people with, uh, you know, faulty models might've had some faulty models, but 
COVID and Corona, that's, that's right. another conversation. Let's get into right. January 6th. So where were you on January 6th? What were you doing? Were you watching this on Periscope like everybody else or what was up? I was just watching it at home. Uh, I had two of my friends over, uh, big Trump supporters, and we were just, you know, interested to see the president's speech and what Republican senators were going to do that day. Of course, their plan was to object to uh, some of the election results in states that we know did not follow election law and see what they were going to do in terms of passing that, you know, 10 day audit that they were looking for. So, never expected what happened that day was going to happen. Uh, I did not have the same response that a lot of people did. Um, I viewed it mostly as there are a lot of angry Americans upset and justifiably so at the betrayal of their government uh, from lockdowns, from the election, et cetera. And that was just sort of manifesting. And you could, that, that was my interpretation for the most part of what was playing out organically that day, not some of the things that had already been happening behind the seats to sow all of that chaos. So that was my take initially. Right, right. And so as things progressed, how did your position change? What did you start to see? What started to pique your interest? Because this wasn't exactly a normal thing that happened, right? This isn't an everyday occurrence, but, uh, you know, how did this you know story begin to evolve for you? And then like, how did you, you really have dug deep. We're talking to you because you have dug deeper into any of this than anybody mm -hmm. else, as far as I can tell, not only into the events of what have gone on uh, on January 6th themselves, but all what's happened subsequently, the cases, who's being charged, why, yeah. how they're being held, what the conditions are. Julie, let's get into it. Let's get into it. Tell me, what was the first thing that made you really be like, oh crap, I gotta take a look here. Um, I think just the hysterical overreaction to what was happening. I mean, you see, you saw that that day, people referring it to, to it as the seditious insurrection, that these people were traitors, that they were there to kill lawmakers. I mean, there definitely were people there who showed up to cause problems. And uh, there were some Trump supporters who assaulted police officers. They vandalized the building. They were places where they shouldn't have been. Um, but for the most part, I just found it striking that people were all of a sudden just calling this a dark day for democracy and how terrorized lawmakers were. You had George W. Bush come out in a statement that day calling it an insurrection. Uh, you know, the Democrats the next day, Nancy Pelosi referring it to as, as an armed insurrection, which it certainly wasn't. So just, I think, you know, my skepticism, which is just normal, I think, as a lot of us are, if you're in this space at all. And so, um, you know, the whole thing with Officer Sicknick, I think that was the biggest red flag for me. And that was why um, I started really looking into who was saying what, what the facts were behind it, who was reporting it what the group think was. And um, I guess that's, that's really where it started. All right, well, let's start with Sicknick. Like what, what was the story? What happened that day? What was the narrative? What did the big, big media companies say, et cetera? So when, what started it was January 7th, the day that Officer Sicknick tragically passed away at the age of 42, Capitol Police, who have been shamefully one of the biggest political perpetrators of this entire narrative, uh, sent out a release that said that Brian Sicknick was killed in the line of duty. He succumbed to injuries sustained by insurrectionists. I don't think they use that term, but uh, basically protesters at the Capitol that day. Um, but it was odd because there was no there was no video or any visuals that saw a police officer who had succumbed to injuries that badly, who was taken away in an ambulance, you would have thought with everything going on, that something would have happened. So that was sort of a vague, uh, that was sort of a telltale sign. But the next day, Jack, is when the New York Times published uh, an article that claimed that uh, Brian Sicknick was bludgeoned to death by protesters using a fire extinguisher. And that um, article was sourced to two anonymous law enforcement officials. That was all the proof that the media needed, the Democrats needed, President Joe Biden needed, and a lot of Republicans to claim that Trump uh, insurrectionists had murdered a police officer at the Capitol that day. Um, but again, there was no proof to it. And of course, anything that comes out of the New York Times, you instantly have to uh, be cynical about. Uh, but it was just alarming to me to see how it was accepted as fact. And every news organization, even conservative publications were repeating that as fact. 
Um, and so I just sort of started digging into that. I posted an article like January 21st asking all kinds of questions about Officer Sicknick, you know, why we hadn't seen any kind of reports about exactly what happened to him. His family was really vague about what had happened to him, asked people not to politicize it. And then, of course, when they did the whole lying in state in the rotunda the weekend before the uh, second impeachment trial started, it was clear that they were using this man's untimely death, exploiting it for political purposes. It was really uh, twisted and grotesque. And so, of course, we find out later, or go ahead, go ahead uh, that he didn't die of anything related to January 6th. You know, I remember... I remember that day or the next day seeing that report about him, a, a police officer getting smashed in the head with a fire extinguisher and that leading to his death. And I want to say it was even reported by like AP or Reuters or somebody where your your first instinct, well, maybe not so much anymore, but at least my first instinct in the past would have been like, oh, okay, you know, AP is reporting it. Maybe it actually really happened. Uh, but that, that wasn't the case whatsoever. Do we have any idea just like where it came from, what the genesis really was? Like who was the first person to come up with this idea and put it out there? We don't know exactly where it came from, but it was uh, in that New York Times article dated January 8th. And they uh, attributed it, as I said, to two anonymous law enforcement officials. What happened was under scrutiny from just a few journalists, uh, myself and a few others, um, they finally, CNN actually, to their credit, uh, released an article that said, or posted an article that said that uh, the coroner had said that there was no evidence of blunt force trauma. So we started really pushing the New York Times and other outlets. And what happened, Jack, was the night before Trump was acquitted, February 12th, the New York Times very quietly posted an update, they called it, to their original article, um, which really was an, a retraction and said that there was no evidence that Officer Sicknick had been attacked by anyone with fire extinguisher. So they retracted that story. Um, unfortunately, it was too late because it had ar it's already ingrained in the narrative of what happened January 6th. That even made it into the House Democrats' impeachment trial memo, specifically that insurrectionists bludgeoned, if that was their word, Officer Sicknick with a fire extinguisher. They cited the New York Times uh, January 8th article as proof. So not only has this been accepted by the media and tons of millions of Americans, um, but also made it into an official government record, and it's a complete lie. The other thing that the Times said was that it was a source close to law enforcement. Well, that could have been anybody. You know, it could have been Adam Schiff. It could have been Nancy Pelosi. It could have been, you know, some guy who was a neighbor with law enforcement. They completely fabricated the story or... They were duped by sources and shame on the New York Times for what they did, lying about what happened to Officer Sicknick. No one, of course, has ever apologized at the New York Times. No reporter has been fired for posting a completely fabricated story. Um, and so I think, uh, Jack, that's sort of when things started to unravel. Uh, and I think other people are starting to catch on that, hey, this very first account of what happened on January 6th isn't exactly what happened, and, and maybe we should take another look at all aspects of it. You know, I know how easy it is to, like, take a piece of information that comes your way and want it to fit the narrative, right? You know, sometimes right. even during the summer, I was guilty of that. Some piece of data would come, and they would I would just instantly put it into my narrative, and and maybe it didn't turn out to be exactly that way. So, like, I, I understand the urge to confirmation bias, right? Like this confirms That's what I'm right. thinking. So I'm going to go ahead and report it. I understand that. But, you know, mm -hmm. New York Times, man, <laughs> like, right. like, come on, they, the, their standards are supposed to be the standard. And it's not quite that the case. Is it like that anymore? No. <laughs> it's, nope. it's really, it's really kind of sad in that regard. Um, okay, so Sicknick doesn't get hit over the head with a fire extinguisher. There's a number of other people there who are allegedly killed that day as well. Like what was the what was the um, body count, you know, after the first day? What was the alleged body count after the first day? So that's a great question. We were told repeatedly that five people died in this deadly insurrection. So Officer Sicknick was one of them. Um, Ashley Babbitt, as we know, was the Trump supporter who was shot and killed by still unidentified Capitol Police officer. And three other people, we were told, died 
because of the mob, because of the chaos, because of what happened. Um, but of course, that all is untrue. The only person who died that day was Ashley Babbitt. She was shot by this police officer. We don't know who. Uh, the D.C. Medical Examiner's Office uh, has ruled it, ruled it a homicide, of course, which it was. Um, and then the Justice Department came out a few weeks later. Uh, this was just a, a few weeks ago, actually, and said that um, uh, Ashley, that uh, they were closing the investigation into who killed Ashley Babbitt, that basically it was a justified homicide. The other three people, two men died of heart attacks, one woman died of a drug overdose. All three not related in any way to what happened at the Capitol building for those few hours on January 6th. So another lie. It was so, not five people, just one. So so the, the heart attacks and the drug overdose, that was not police officers? Those were just other people in attendance? Right. Those were people. I don't even know if they were at the Capitol. They were just people who died in Washington that day. I guess a few of them they know were there to hear the president. There's no evidence that any of those people were inside or even outside the Capitol if they had been anywhere in Washington, D.C. Uh, and so, the, as I said, so the body count, we're told, is five. I actually heard a federal judge the other day in one of the detention hearings say that five people were killed that day. So it doesn't, the facts don't matter. The reality doesn't matter. It's already part of the storyline uh, when in reality only one person was killed, and that was Ashley Babbitt. And is it standard operating procedure for the police to obscure the names of uh, police officers who are involved in a shooting of a civilian? Not that I know of. Right. Usually, Jack, as you know, when a civilian is killed by a cop, we know instantaneously not just the cop's name, where he lives, what his history is, um, et cetera. We still don't know anything about that officer, um, but he's already been exonerated by an internal investigation at the uh, Justice Department. And have you seen any other media outlets pressing pressing the Capitol Police on this or anybody pressing at all besides you and some of the other bold voices out there? Nobody. I mean, it's just astonishing to see, again, the lack of curiosity or interest by major news organizations like The New York Times, who, of course, ran with a fabricated story about Officer Sicknick, but has no interest in tracking down the name of the Capitol Police officer who shot and killed Ashley Babbitt. It's been completely buried. Um, I believe her family, though, I saw something is filing a lawsuit trying to find out who that officer is, and perhaps they will seek legal action and his identity will be revealed. How can they not then, know who killed their daughter? That's insane right. to me. That's mm -hmm. it's it's very scary. It's very scary, but I have a feeling that our conversation is going to get even scarier here in a second once we start talking about the people that they actually arrested, what they're being charged with, how they're being cared for, how they're being handled and held and what the expectation is there. But I just want to restate again for the record. There was officially a body count of 5 on the day of by mass media. Mm -hmm. It has been restated by judges in hearings. It has been admitted into the congressional record during an impeachment, and yet completely, totally false, proven to be so at this point. And no one is even still carrying on that number five body count number, right? But they're just calling it deadly. They're just calling it the armed insurrection, okay. whatever. And now, and now that fact is just is gone. It doesn't even matter. You talk to people who are just regular people doing their regular lives, just mm -hmm. catching headlines as they go, and you try to tell them that January 6th wasn't an armed insurrection, that nobody got killed by the insurrectionists, and they're just like, yeah, whatever, dude, sky's blue. I don't know what you're talking about. That just doesn't compute yep. for them. So it's really right. powerful testament to the... the well, the need to be first with your narrative, first of all, because the first one wins, even if it's wrong and just the general power of story here, and then also what it reveals about people's interest in wanting to pursue the truth. Pursuit of truth seems to be dead. It's gone. They don't care. It's just about whatever makes them feel good or whatever makes the world feel like it makes sense, even if it's insanity, even if it just, as long as it meets your expectations, right? So just for the record, no, no one was killed by an insurgent, a protester, a rioter. The only death related to all the events there was the, sh the shooting of Ashley, and we still don't know who killed her. Great. So that's the end of the story. It's not going to get any worse, right? 
Right. <laughs> right. Right. So who was there that day actually, right? Like I was on the grounds. I was front row, literally front row for the, the Trump speech. I thought it was mediocre. Wasn't really that good. I wanted it to be better, but it wasn't. I thought it was sort of a half-assed stump speech that didn't really have too much energy to it. There was not a single person in the crowd who was motivated enough by his tepid, mediocre words to like storm the castle and sacrifice their lives for the sake of, you know, stopping the electoral college. That being said, there was definitely people in town who wanted to protest. They wanted to make a statement. They wanted to just do something, anything, right? You have to remember, right? We had a whole year basically going back to the end of May where truly the country was under siege. There was fires and riots and destruction and people who deny it, man. I was literally there standing there with the tear gas in my eyes, getting shot by rubber bullets as people launched bricks over my head to hit cops and to destroy buildings. I watched people loot from 20 feet in front of me, looting entire retail stores, setting restaurants on fire, trying to light office buildings on fire. We were there. There was like a six alarm fire of an office building that they set on fire but nobody believes that this happened okay now i'm not justifying anything that anybody did on the six but that was the mood that was the That's mood right. that people were carrying with them but it certainly didn't come from that boring ass speech that he gave so what happened who were the people who were there because it wasn't the people in attendance at the speech because i was at the speech i got up and i left as soon as the speech was over and there was already an enormous amount of people down the mall and it wasn't the people who were there for the speech Right. So there definitely were people, as you said, and the people who I talked to, I was not there either. But the people who were there say the exact same thing that you are saying, Jack. And that was, there was just a really eerie feeling that day. It was not like any other Trump rally. They had had rallies in D.C. in November and December. And the same people who, were organi who had organized those rallies and who were involved in the Stop the Steal rally said, there was just a real tension. They could tell that something was up. Um, and so one thing that people insist is that this was not just all Trump supporters. There obviously were agitators of all types who already were at the Capitol building that morning prepared to cause trouble. Um, the media was already there, uh, I believe, in several cases actually stoking what was happening, encouraging people to act up so they could take photographs that were then blasted on social media right afterwards, which we saw in one case we could talk about Richard Barnett, the man in Nancy Pelosi's office. So, but look, there were a lot of people who were there who wanted to make their voices heard. They wanted to make sure that Congress and the Republican senators knew that there was a force outside a group of people who wanted them to hold accountable these uh, unlawful elections in several of these states. Now, unfortunately, the Senate Republicans, because they are hapless, craven hacks who have no idea what they're doing, waited far too long to try to address what had happened in those states. Um, and so, so I do. So there were a lot of people there, regular Americans of all races of all socioeconomic strata, of all ages who were there, who wanted to rightfully protest what they viewed, at, legitimately viewed as an illegitimate election. And I think some of them got caught up in the chaos of what was happening that day. Um, but the way that they've been treated by this Justice Department, this political persecution, this nationwide manhunt to uh, raid people's homes and uh, arrest them then transport them to Washington, D.C., where dozens are remain in uh, solitary confinement before they even had their first real hearing, before any sort of trial has begun. Um, this is really tragic, what's happened, and that's really my biggest interest right now is, is covering some of those cases. All right. <clears throat> There's a lot, a lot you said there. Now, I've seen, uh, look, I was on the mall. I, was, I saw the vibes. There were definitely moms and grandmas and families and people there being super chill and just wanting to protest or even just be around in the vicinity, right? Mm -hmm. There were definitely guys who dressed like they were looking to be operators, acting in team, in coordination with, you know, I'm not going to go so far as to say training, but definitely a little coordination, right? Like they were mm -hmm. doing some synchronized moves and they were you know, moving through the crowd and such. 
were where in your in your estimation in your analysis were there people there specifically to protest in a way that would be deemed criminal right let's let, let's call it that instead of just like being there showing up making noise banging on the door i mean look i have stood at the door of the Supreme Court when an angry mob was pounding on the doors of the Supreme Court saying, let us in, let us in. And again, guys, I'm not making this up. I was literally standing right there. It was one of the first times I had a Periscope go mega viral. It was like front page on Periscope. We had over 100,000 people live watching because I was one foot away from the Kavanaugh mob trying to destroy mm -hmm. the front door of the Supreme Court. And no one, they, I was there too. They stormed through the barricades, okay? They knocked them over, they dragged them over, and they ran up the stairs. So, like, I've seen, I've seen what protest looks like in D.C. when people get upset, okay? And that yes. was something that people found to be acceptable. And so some version of going to the Capitol and banging on the front door, I think that's fair play. Now, yep. Where there are people there who were seeking to do things beyond fair play? And, you know, who were they? Um, well, I, I don't know who they are, honestly, because um, in a lot of the cases that I've researched, people were not there. Now, let's back up a little bit. You mentioned the armed insurrection. No one has been charged or identified with carrying any sort of firearm into the Capitol building that day. Only two people have been charged with possession of fire. And those are people who um, had violated DC's very strict gun control laws, right? So one man was found with his truck. He had ammunition. He had a few guns in there. He was arrested, but he didn't take it into the Capitol. He was arrested that night as he was going back to his truck. Um, also, there was one man who was caught with just a small pistol. Um, and he was charged, but he wasn't inside the building either. So with this idea that you had groups of people who had premeditated some kind of armed insurrection, that they were going to go in and try to hunt down Mike Pence or other lawmakers is um, ridiculous. And so that is a big part of uh, also debunking what happened that day. There were people there who had various sort of little small batons. You had Richard Barnett who had the... Um, uh, uh, walking stick that was also a stun gun, but most of the weapons are just a joke. I mean, one man was charged with using a helmet as a deadly and dangerous weapon. One man was, two men were charged with a riot shield that had just been left there and they picked it up. Um, so these are people, some of them who just got out of hand, right? And we know that, and they should still be held responsible for what they did. But what you see the Justice Department doing, and I think they're up to 400 arrests right now, is just adding on ridiculous charges, um, and one we could talk about specifically, obstruction of an official proceeding, <laughs> in attempts to build this sedition case that the Justice Department and FBI came out with January 12th, a big press conference, and said they were going to take misdemeanor cases, they were going to charges, they were going to build them into sedition cases against regular Americans. They haven't done it yet, but they're trying really hard. Well, that, that, that is a very good point. How desperate are they for charges, right? Like, God, don't you, they're just like champing at yes. the bit. Like, give, I want to charge these people with the biggest and most heinous crime possible. Where are the charges, Julie? They're um, struggling, they, well, they aren't can't, they? Yeah, they are struggling um, because you can't really charge Americans for sedition for doing what you just pointed out. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, not only were people banging on the door of the Supreme Court, you had thousands of protesters in the Hart Senate office building. They were trying to disrupt the confirmation hearing. Um, they were accosting senators, Jeff Flake in elevators, uh, Susan Collins, Lindsey Graham, remember him walking down the street, people were screaming. But, but that was no different really than what happened for the most part on January 6th. Um, but they're having a hard time. They're trying to build these conspiracy cases like against the Oath Keepers, um, against some of the Proud Boys, and maybe turn those into sedition cases. Luckily, the DC Appellate Court uh, seems to be the only hope for a lot of these defendants to get any sort of fair trial. We can talk about one of their rulings that has sort of had an effect, uh, downstream effect on other cases. Um, but no, they're. There, you know, Michael Sherwin. I know you saw that interview, Jack. 
uh, who oversaw this investigation the first two months gave this braggadocious interview to 60 Minutes saying how the first 100 people that they were arrested was an attempt to show shock and awe to intimidate Americans into not coming to Washington, D.C. on January 20th to protest Joe Biden's inauguration. I mean, that's just an outlandish comment to make. And if I were one of the first 100 defendants arrested between January 7th and January 20th, I sure would go back to the judge or the prosecutors and say this was had nothing to do with what happened January 6th. Uh, my, you know, they're being used as political props. In, in your estimation, what was the most severe crime that you observed or that you've seen act actually happened? Um, I mean, I think smashing the windows and uh, trying to attack police officers. I mean, some of them were grabbed. I know one man has been charged with punching a police officer in the face. I, I haven't really looked at that case. I don't even know if he's a Trump supporter or not. So there definitely were instances a couple of times of people attacking police officers. Uh, but for the most part, these charges are just laughable. And they're mostly related to trespassing and disorderly conduct. And so, um, but they're doubling up, tripling up on those sort of charges too. So how are they going around doing this, right? They, they didn't really, did they arrest too many people that day? I, I don't think so, right? All of these arrests yeah. have come after the fact, after they've done their analysis. And man, we could probably talk a long time about their data, their data analysis. Like, well, how did they identify these people? What are they doing? What technology? But, but why don't we just, act, why don't we talk about that? Like, how are they identifying these people and then what are they doing? And like, walk us through, walk us through like one of the more egregious circumstances that you've come across of just grandma or whatever, chilling at home right now. All of a sudden there's feds on the door, on the doorstep. Um, that certainly has happened in many cases, but the case that sticks out to me is um, a young man named Bruno Kua. He's 18 years old. He's a high school senior, lives on a farm in Georgia. He and his parents went to uh, Washington, D.C. They drove together on January 5th, listened to the president's speech. The three of them gen then walked down to the Capitol building. He went inside the building, Bruno, uh, who is their oldest child. Uh, there, He's homeschooled. His parents have been married for 20 some odd years, you know, representative of a lot of families who wanted to go that day. Bruno went inside the building. He was uh, photographed apparently inside the Senate chamber, or House chamber, one uh, House chamber, and uh, was walking around. He had a small collapsible baton, really. He didn't use it. He just had it with him. Some people were bringing items like that because they were worried that Antifa, they were warned that Antifa and other protesters were going to be there. They wanted some means to protect themselves. So he didn't use this anyway. 18 years old, he's arrested uh, in Atlanta by Atlanta FBI on February 6th. He is denied bail, even though, of course, he's 18. He has no criminal record. Um, what the prosecutor said in that case about his parents, um, that they should not, he should not be released to his parents as, because they're not good custodians, because Bruno is homeschooled. Um, because he ingested, that was their word, hit their political beliefs. Um, and they were irresponsible for not only taking their son to the rally that day, but also a stop the steal rally uh, in his hometown after the election. So his father and mother were grilled by government lawyers about how they raised their son, why they took him that day, uh, at one point questioned, made sure that Mr. Kua, uh, Bruno's father, admitted that there was no election fraud. I mean, this is in the hearing transcript. And at one point, prosecutors threatened to charge the parents because as they were explaining the events of that afternoon, I guess they revealed that they were in a restricted area outside the Capitol. And they thought about charging them, too, for trespassing. Um, they transported Bruno to an Oklahoma City jail where he sat um, in solitary confinement for several weeks, was only released after he contracted COVID and finally was allowed to go home after, I think, about seven weeks in jail. Okay. An 18-year-old charged with what now? Um, he was charged with various uh, trespassing, disorderly conduct, possession of a deadly and dangerous weapon, which was the small collapsible baton. He didn't use it. He just right. had it on him. Right. And uh, obstruction of an official proceeding, which pretty much everyone has been charged with. So right. he didn't then, attack anybody. 
Didn't held held in solitary confinement, got infected because of the conditions in the jail that he was in. This sounds very un-American to me. I have one of those collapsible batons. I have a freaking bulletproof vest that I wear to the protests. Sure. Okay. And I didn't at first because I didn't know what was happening. But then I get out there and I get shot. I get, you know, there's people getting stabbed. Right. There's people getting hit over the head. There's people getting killed. Wearing right. a wearing a bulletproof vest to a protest in 2021 is a very reasonable and rational thing to do, as well as carrying a small self-defense device, which is really not that big of a deal. It's not even really illegal. You just can't bring it to a protest and then use it in a way where you were planning to, planning to do it. Right. So they're rounding up teenagers and moms and kids. They're throwing them in solitary confinement for some time. They're being held in solitary because of Corona and other bull crap. And they're really trying very hard to build the biggest, nastiest cases possible. What is the progress on this overall sedition case and this whole big insurrection thing that, that you know, that, that they're clearly, and then let's talk about Biden's speech as well, that they're clearly using as the foundation for all of the de-Trumpification efforts that they wanted right. to do before January 6th even happened. This is why I was so upset about January 6th. All January 6th did is just give them free reign to do the things that they wanted to do. They were searching for justification. January 6th handed them the justification, and now they're going to go ape. So tell me, what does the case look like? Are they moving forward? Does it have legs? Are they going to drag people out even if they don't have a real case? What's going to happen? Well, they keep arresting people. I get alerts almost every day of new people who have been arrested and charged with really the same repeat offenses that we keep seeing. Um, my opinion, Jack, is that they are going to try to drag this out into 2022, much like the Mueller probe. This will be sort of the uh, re redux of Robert Mueller. They're going to drag this into 2022. They're going to hold these people. They're going to tie these people to whoever is running, especially any senators who objected to the Electoral College uh, results that day. And they're just going to drag this out, as you said, to de-Trumpify the party, to, uh, I think, intimidate people from attending any political rallies at all, let alone a Trump rally if he starts those up again. Um, so this is just going to be weaponized. But the thing is, they've overloaded the D.C. Um, judicial system so much that these trials are being delayed for months and months. Some people cannot even get a public defender. They're actually bringing public defenders in from other states to represent people who either can't find or can't afford their own attorney. A lot of these people aren't wealthy at all. They're you know, just working class Americans or farmers or whoever. Um, and so they actually are having to bring attorneys in from other states to help defend these people as their trials just drag on and on. Um, but we're starting to see more hearings this week. I've covered a few of them, including the two men who were charged with using bear spray that wasn't bear spray against Officer Sicknick. There was a hearing on that this week, too. They are being held, denied bail, uh, also in solitary confinement in, in Washington, D.C. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a prosecutor. I'm not a cop. But I have to think that the standards for being held pretrial and solitary confinement should be pretty high, right? Mm -hmm. This doesn't seem to meet that threshold. Do you, are you familiar with like legal threshold for something like that? Well, I'm learning. I'm not yeah. an attorney either, which I think actually helps me in a way because I try to like dumb it down to my level. Right, right. <laughs> so, um, but yes, the threshold is often very high, but what judges are, federal judges are signing off on and what government lawyers are arguing in court is that because these people doubt the outcome of the 2020 election, they don't accept Joe Biden as the legitimately elected president, they will not follow the laws of the U.S. government. You had judge a judge actually say early on to this defendant, another one just charged with trespassing. He wasn't even charged with a violent crime. Um, he's the Cowboys for Trump guy. He's the first person that I wrote about. He never even entered the Capitol building. He was far outside of the Capitol in a restricted area. 
And one judge said, well, if you don't believe in this, pre of course, he's not president yet, right? This is back in January. If you didn't believe that he is the legit, was the legitimately elected president, you're not going to follow me because I follow what I say because I'm part of this system too. You see this being said over and over by federal judges. They actually are overturning judges' rulings in the original jurisdiction, the state where the, these people are detainees are actually first arrested. They're being let go on home detention or whatever. The federal judge, uh, U.S. district judges, come ov overrule that with the help of the government, and then they are denied bail and they're they're kept in jail. And a lot of them, like I said, have been transported to Washington, D.C. So now it's a thought crime. So the thought crime is you don't think that the 2020 election was on the up and up. You don't accept that Joe Biden was legitimately elected. Therefore, you don't believe in any of the laws of the United States government. It's just insane to see this coming out of people's mouths. It is insane. It's terrifying. And I'll admit that I just, for some reason, there's a part of me that is still optimistic. There's, I'm still not as black hearted and cynical as I probably should be. So when I hear about judges overreaching and saying these crazy things, it still surprises me, even though it probably shouldn't at this point. Um, I wonder if I'm ever going to let go, let go of that feeling of being surprised by some of this nonsense as it comes down the pipe, even though it's totally predictable and fits in with the model and is exactly uh, on trend and doesn't seem to be changing in any way uh, whatsoever. And when I see the energy that they're putting into this, the, the billboards and the bus stop advertisements okay. and the commercials and the constant stream of people's face, have you seen this person? Have you seen that person? I mean, at some point I feel like somebody is just on the left is just going to have to say like, well, hold up guys. We can't just kill everybody. Right. Like th th this right. feels like this thing is headed in that direction where, where like our health and well being is legitimately going to be at the mercy of somebody on the left putting the brakes on. So that's a pretty bad uh, strategy. Mercy expecting mercy from your enemies as your strategy is a bad strategy. That's kind of where um, we are right now. It certainly is, and Jack, to what you're saying, not one Republican lawmaker, uh, senator, a few congressmen spoke up in a House Intelligence Committee meeting, but no Republican senator has said anything about these political prisoners being held hostage by their own government, but two Democratic senators have said something. Elizabeth Warren and Dick Durbin both have spoken up with their concern that these people are being held without bail in uh, DC jails. They are the only two who have said anything shockingly. But like you said, um, you know, waiting for anyone on the left to say something is one thing. Waiting for anyone on the right in the Republican Party, now that it's well known that people are being held without bail, not meeting any sort of high threshold, uh, and the comments that are being made by judges and prosecutors to hear this deafening silence from Republicans uh, is is just infuriating. It is. We have to stop playing this game. I mean, I'm in my mind. I'm thinking about these 13 and 15 year old girls that carjacked a guy and killed him here in D.C. just a few weeks ago. And mm -hmm. that kind of crime is being dismissed practically, whereas walking through the door and being in the wrong place at the wrong time and disrupting a proceeding uh, is something worthy of full extent of the, you know, beyond the full prosecution of the law. Like let's go They're They're way overshooting with that, but they're not, they're not going to stop and no one's there to slow them down. And even the judges are on board with it and no one's really standing up and defending these people. You're one of them, which is why I wanted to talk to you to get these names out there, to get these stories out there so that people can be equipped to understand and interpret reality. So you under part, part of this exercise is just so that people get prepared for what's coming in 2021, 22, right. 23, 24. This, this is the defining moment uh, for, for sort of the, def it defines the, the platform from which all this other stuff is going to, is going to jump off of. These are armed insurrectionists, the most deadly attack on democracy since the Civil War. Like, did he really say that? And then in the same speech, 
terror, all these bad, terrible guys, terror, 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 terror. And of course, the most lethal threat we face in America at home today, white supremacy is terrorism. This is what Joe Biden said. Now, we know, of course, how they define white supremacy. White supremacy is defined as basically all the great things about America. <laughs> being on right. time, being hardworking, being objective, believing in individualism, believing in pulling yourself up by the bootstraps, believing in hard work and dedication and data and science. These things are all white supremacy culture. Therefore, all the things that we love about America are now considered terrorism by our own president. I wish I was making this stuff up, Julie. I wish, I wish that I didn't feel like some scumbag conspiracy theorist when I'm simply repeating back to them the words that they're using in their own literature and in front of a joint session of Congress when addressing the nation with a carefully crafted speech that was intended to be read and parsed and put away in the history books. I'm hot about that from last night, Julie. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction? Well, I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, <laughs> look, you have the intelligence community, um, which was confronted. They were confronted by uh, Representative Devin Nunes and other Republicans on the House Intelligence Committee. They are violating their authority by going after Americans under the guise of terrorism. The intelligence community, the director of national intelligence, Avril Haines, who is a John Brennan lackey, they um, are going outside of their authority, basically breaking the law by producing documents claiming that the biggest uh, threat in the country are domestic violent extremists. And when one congressman, um, Chris Stewart from Utah, did a great job, he confronted all of these intelligence community uh, officials and said, you're not allowed to spy on Americans, right? This is not what you're supposed to do. They all admitted it, but Avril Haines, her first duty, uh, she released a report at the beginning of March talking about this threat. And on the top of the column that says domestic violent extremism is a picture of the US Capitol. Like oh they're not even trying to be subtle. This is what they're creating. So to hear Joe Biden say that, Jack, I didn't think a president could be more divisive than Barack Obama. Joe Biden, for once, is actually doing something better than Barack Obama did. He is so much more divisive. Uh, he's just tort gaslighting this country. Uh, I don't know if he really realizes what he's saying, uh, if he's just reading the words that are given to him, but just another shameful example. Um, and, but this is all perpetrated by a lot of these Obama holdovers, uh, loyalists, what they're doing, and of course, fully emboldened by the Democrats and a lot of Republicans, too. Joe Biden is an Obama holdover. Okay, so here's the deal about Joe Biden. He's a stupid idiot, okay? In 2000, 2011, he pushed the Dear Colleague letter, which changed the Title IX regulations, which stripped people of due process on college campuses because he fell to the rape culture myth. There's articles detailing how these activists, mm -hmm. using a flawed study that overstated all kinds of rape and whatever, basically made it so that if somebody thinks something about you that you don't like, it gets marked down as rape. They use this study to pull on the heartstrings of good old Joe, Grandpa Joe Biden, and make him be like, oh, there's a rape, rape crisis, rape culture in America. We better do everything we got. We got to stop the rape crisis. Doesn't matter if the kids have, uh, you know, constitutional rights or due process or have a hearing or can face their accuser or even know what the accusation is. Nope, doesn't matter. That was Joe Biden. Joe Biden is the king of rape culture. He's the one that pushed it on America, basically by formalizing it in the 2011 Dear Colleague letter, which then increased all wokeness on college campuses. You can see the data. It's very clear. 2011, 2012 woke stuff to the freaking moon. So I am unsurprised. In fact, I predicted it before he was elected, even in the face of some of our more moderate people that we may know who are like, oh, Biden won't be so woke. It's good to have him back. Bah, 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 bah. Bull crap, total bull crap. And it's come out now. Last night, he sits down in front of Congress, joint session, which he delayed by months. I believe it was one of the latest first joint mm -hmm sessions of Congress addresses by any president going back farther than Carter and even back before that, I believe. It was very calculated and very deliberate. I believe it was tied potentially to the January 6th investigations, why they had this delay, 
right? They wanted to delay it and so that they could have as big of a case to make so that they can say white, white supremacy, a.k.a. white culture, a.k.a. you are a terrorist, bro. The majority of people in America are now terrorists, according to our white grandpa president. It would Great be grandpa. sad and pathetic if it wasn't. No, it would be hysterical if it wasn't so <laughs> sad and pathetic and terrifying. Right. What are they going to do with this, Julie? What's the timeline? How fast? When, when do the trains load us up? I know, exactly. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, there was one, two encouraging things I'll say really quickly. One, the D.C. appellate court, uh, three appointees, I believe, one from Obama, one Clinton, one Trump, who smacked down uh, the case of uh, Eric Munchall, the zip tie guy. Remember the guy holding yep. up the zip ties? Um, just funny, there was a big stash of them there and a photographer just happened to be there when he picked them up or maybe he was prompted to pick them up, so he did. Um, I, they were, uh, they both turned themselves in. It was he and his mother who had gone to the Trump speech and then were inside the Capitol. They turned themselves in. They also were held, denied, bail. Um, that got kicked up to the D.C. Uh, appellate uh, circuit. They smacked down both the judge who ruled on that and also federal prosecutors. And they really outlined what needs to the thresholds, as you said, that need to be met for keeping these protesters uh, behind bars pending trial. That has had, as I said, a downstream effect on a lot of these detainees. There was uh, the man, Richard Barnett, who was photographed in Nancy Pelosi's office. It ends up, it wasn't at her, his, uh, at her desk, it was just a desk there. Funny, again, reporter, or photographers just happened to be in Nancy Pelosi's office, encouraged Mr. Barnett to act natural, sit at the desk and act natural as they took his photograph. Suddenly that somehow got to Nancy Pelosi's daughter, Christine, who tweeted it out to the world within an hour of that picture being taken. So you had media agitators also there that day. Um, but anyway, Judge Cooper this week, I listened into the hearing. He made some crazy statements. He said five people were killed, et cetera, but also released Mr. Barnett after he has been held in jail for four months, citing this Munchell case uh, for the DC, uh, that the DC appellate court. So I think that these judges and the government now see this is going to get kicked up to the appellate court, and they were not very pleased with how um, at least Eric Munchell and his mother were treated, but also uh, gave a warning shot to the gov government and to the courts about uh, what they were going to do with these people being held behind bars, nonviolent protesters. It's a shame. So there's a little. It's a shame. It's what we got to do, though. This is part of it. We have to keep reporting on it. We have to keep bringing the truth out. We have to keep speaking the truth. People listening, you have to keep repeating the truth. I mean, sure, we're a little bit biased, but these facts are facts. No one got killed except for Ashley. No one brought a deadly weapon except for the cops. Half the people were let in the door. I saw the open doors walking past police officers. Some of them did some bad things. They should be prosecuted. 18-year-old kids should not be held in solitary confinement for weeks because of trespassing. This is sad. But we got to keep doing this, guys. We got to keep fighting back. Julie, you got to keep doing what you're doing. I really, truly appreciate the work and effort yeah. that you're putting in. Really. Somebody had to do it. You're doing it. It's got to be thankless. <laughs> there's, there's no real rewards about it. Uh, but you're doing the right thing and you're doing good work and we do truly appreciate it. And we know that you're on it and I'm sure there's going to be updates and keep investigating. If there's anything that I can do to help you out or to help move this thing along, please let me know. This January 6th in my mind is in, in my head, I can hear it for a date that will live on in infamy. January 6th is going to be the WMD of 2021. And by that, I mean, it is going to be the false pretense by which a counterterrorism effort is enacted upon the American people in the same way that WMD was used as a false pretense to invade Iraq. Rosie is barking at the mailman. It wouldn't be a podcast <laughs> if it wasn't with a guest appearance by the dog. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is important stuff because this is going to shape the interactions that we have with the federal government over the next four years or maybe longer. Right. And they're going to use this to come after people that just donate money. You know, the same mindset, right? The white supremacy is terrorism mindset, right? Everything is terrorism now. Functuality is terrorism. Rugged individualism is terrorism. 
This is the mindset that they're, they're going to use when people get fired for donating money to Kyle Rittenhouse's legal fund. Heaven forbid that the guy get due process. Remember when John Adams represented the British in the Boston Massacre? Good grief. That's what America is based on. That is our values. Those are our values. I am getting hot about it. <laughs> but Julie, again, thank I you so you. much for your time and energy. Thank you so much for your work. Pe where can people find you? How can they support you? Tell us. Well, thank you so much for having me on and for your coverage of this. And as we go on, you know, I, you're uh, bringing attention to it and it is going to be vitally important to spreading the word. Um, so my work can be found at amgreatness.com. That's where all my articles are. Uh, I'm on Twitter a lot. As you know, Julie underscore Kelly two is my Twitter handle. And um, hopefully on another podcast of Jack Murphy soon once I figure out how to get my camera to work on my laptop. But anyway, that's I appreciate that, Julie. Life. No worries about the technical issues. We yeah. are a gorilla on the street outfit here. <laughs> Nobody expects us to be CNN. That's why they're listening. So it's all part of the show. I appreciate it. Uh, citizen journalism, Julie, this is what it's all about. This is the future. Yeah. This is the future, uh, citizen journalists, info militias, and we are working together to bring the truth to the people. Very few people are out there doing that right now. And in fact, the people that control the means of information distribution, they certainly don't want you to have the truth. So please support people like Julie who are out there digging in and really putting in the time and energy to figure this out for all of us, for history, for posterity. And again, thanks for coming on the show. Make sure you guys follow her on Twitter. Follow me on Twitter at Jack Murphy Live. Subscribe to my YouTube channel right now, hit that reminder button so you know when the live streams are coming and share this widely, guys. I get a lot of comments all the time on my YouTube page saying your channel is wildly unsubscribe, undersubscribed. I agree, 44,000, we need more guys. So share the videos, wow. that is the way that that works. I appreciate it. Julie, once again, thanks so much, guys. Thank and you. we are out. Stream is ended.